Okay. Good morning, everybody. So on Wednesdays, and it won't happen every Wednesday, or it might, it depends on uh, how tired I am on Tuesdays, but on most Wednesdays we're going to have quizzes. They'll be at the end of the class, uh, 15 minutes at the end of the class. What I will ask when you come in on Wednesdays, please make sure there's a seat between you and your neighbor. So when you come in on Wednesdays, spread out is, is what I'm asking for. Uh, the quizzes will not be that difficult, and as I said, I'm, you have to write five, uh, because that's what I'm going to use for your marks. If you only write four, you will get zero for one of those. So uh, you should have opportunity to write eight to ten, uh, if, should you like. I will also tell you, uh, it's a good idea to write the quizzes, even if you get 100% in the first five quizzes, I would still continue to write the quizzes because they're a good way to check if you're getting the material. So, uh, so on Wednesdays, please, I'll, I'll make the announcement in the morning, particularly when, I have, uh, when we have a quiz. If we don't have a quiz, I won't, but I'll ask you to spread out a little bit. Uh, okay, now as you notice, I mostly will be using the board, and then at the end of class, typically, I may throw some things up uh, on the projector, but for the most part, uh, if you download the notes, you'll notice that everything I'm talking about is in those PowerPoint notes for the most part. Uh, maybe not everything, but almost everything will be there. Uh, and it may not necessarily be in the same order, because I sometimes will switch the order up. But everything will be there. Everything is also in the textbook, so, you know, if you miss a class, find a friend uh, to to get some notes, but the other thing you'll notice, I put up the videos, the videos will be going up too, so if you miss a class, you'll have that video thing. Uh, I like seeing the attendance because, well, it's, it's not very much fun talking to an empty room. Uh, so, let's get back to some chemistry. We've been talking about oxidation of alcohols to aldehydes and ketones. We talked about how we can oxidize primary alcohols to aldehydes, but that they quite often may not stop here. They'll continue on to the carboxylic acid, okay? We'll talk a little bit about that today. Secondary alcohols will give us, let's put our ketones. Okay, so let's take a look today at how we might do this. We typically do oxidations using some reagents. Remember with redox reactions we're oxidizing the alcohol, so we need something that can easily be reduced. Uh, the fact that something can be easily reduced means that it's probably a good oxidizing agent. Uh, we have kind of a, a general mechanism, and that general mechanism involves our alcohol reacting with something which we'll call Oh, let's do it. What's the nomenclature they use? Something that has, okay, this is a little bit different nomenclature, but it's, it's what your book uses. Something that has a leaving group, and it has something else that'll leave, and typically, although, well, let's not even write this, because the mechanisms are usually going to be quite different, and they're usually not. They're usually multi-step reactions, but what we, we get is <coughs> our oxygen gets bonded to this thing that can now leave, and this other portion of the molecule, uh, of this molecule goes out somewhere, maybe used later for a base, but we get this. These things are typically, not always, but typically, inorganic acids. And the first two examples we're going to look at today involve inorganic acids. Uh, and this then is simply 
an inorganic acid ester. Now don't forget, uh, down here has nothing to do with any of this, so I'll put a line there. Uh, we can react, and we're going to see this later, Organic molecules form esters. This is an organic ester. We can do the same thing with inorganic acids. We can react inorganic acids with an alcohol to form an inorganic acid ester. And that's what these typically are. Oops, sorry. Now, what else happens is we will typically have a something that can be basic in the reaction mixture and this is where we have our oxidation step. So the first part of the reaction, our leaving group attaches, usually we talk about it as being ester formation and then a base comes along and it's just a beta elimination reaction. Okay, I've kept the charges there, but oops, and I want to talk about the, this is the oxidation step. Okay, so at that point, our organic molecule is oxidized, but uh, our oxidizing agent gets reduced. Okay, so typically it will be uh, inorganic acid that has some metal with variable oxidation states and it goes from a high oxidation state to a lower oxidation state because our carbon goes from a lower oxidation state to a higher oxidation state. So always in redox as we learned in first year, when something is oxidized, something else is reduced. One of the common reagents to use is something called uh, Jones's reagent. There's two, and really what this is, is chromic acid. And chromic acid itself is a little bit complicated. It's, off, it's really a mixture of chromic acid and dichromic acid, but we won't get into that. Okay, so chromium is a nice reagent to use because it has a lot of uh, oxidation states. It commonly has, it has nice stable oxidation states, plus two, plus three, and plus six. As well, has plus one, plus four, and plus five. So basically chromium can have any oxidation state, it wants almost as long as it just likes to get rid of electrons. It likes to be a positively charged uh, center. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why it's a good oxidizing agent. So we typically make Jones's reagent uh, either by adding chromium trioxide plus H2SO4 or Sodium dichromate plus H2SO4. The chromium is plus six in all of these and the chromic acid, both of these are Jones's reagent. And what we use will depend on what we can find in the lab. Typically, this is, this is very common because this is a nice easy thing to work with. Uh, this, is, this is also fairly common but it just doesn't dissolve up as nicely as the sodium uh, dichromate does. Uh, but our active reagent
is chromic acid. Uh, okay, I'll talk about that at the end. So chromic acid is our active reagent. Uh, let's take a look at the, oh. So what happens is uh, we have our chromium goes from a high oxidation state to a lower oxidation state. We also get a color change. During the course of the reaction, our reaction goes from orange to what color? Green, I believe. Yep, green. Okay, so uh, this was actually the basis for early breathalyzer tests was the Jones reagent because if you have alcohol uh, reacting with this orange compound, the solution will become green and it's a way of testing. It provides a way to test to see if we have primary or secondary alcohols around is to throw some Jones reagent in there and see if we get a color change. So let's take a look at the mechanism. So we're going to be drawing chromic acid. You guys right now could be seeing if you could draw the structure of chromic acid. And the first step of our reaction is ester formation. So we're going to take a primary alcohol and chromic acid. Oops. Inorganic molecules are quite often, uh, because we have a lot of elements that are below the second row of the periodic table, uh, and we can have expanded valencies. They don't follow the octet rule, uh, and they're quite reactive. They're big, and they uh, are very, uh, very good reagents for organic chemists to use because of uh, their typical reactivities. So let's, what happens? The first thing that happens is ester formation and whenever you form an ester, your alcohol is your nucleophile and your acid is your electrophile. So nucleophiles always tack electrophiles and I'll go through the mechanism of this we get RCH2 look at that, a lot of oxygen around there and you can imagine that protons jump on, protons jump off, okay Protons will find an oxygen, they'll jump on, and then they are easily removed once we have this uh, positive oxonium center. Okay, so this proton is just going to jump on and jump off oxygens, and it'll find itself over here somewhere at some point. So we don't need to push the arrows necessarily. What we want to find, get though, is that we have. Okay, and uh, we're doing this under acidic conditions and we end up uh, We're good. Uh, we've now protonated uh, one of our oxygens and water can just leave here and we get to where we want to be. We form this ester. Ch 
What did I do wrong? Oh, we'll do this. Okay, sorry, this is a two steps. Two steps. Uh, we end up getting a positively charged center where we have uh, loss of a proton in the final step to get to our ester. Now, really what's important is from here to here is ester formation. Okay, that's our reactive species. And I'm just going to change it. I know it's irritating for you because I just used my eraser. But now, don't forget. Does the, does the base take the hydrogen? There's always a base that acts as the shuttle. Remember, there's all, uh, or, it, or it could happen intramolecularly too if it's convenient and can happen. So we quite often don't talk about those steps. Protons always move around by having bases acting as little shuttles, okay? A base will come and it'll pick up a proton and then it can deposit that proton somewhere else. Uh, so now specifically we will put our base in here and our base can be, uh, we haven't specifically added a base. Uh, this is done in acidic solutions. So the base is typically the conjugate base of your acid. Which hydrogen? Uh, the one to the right. This yeah. one? Yeah. Here we would, let me draw the structure that we would have gotten there. And the only reason I didn't is just because it takes so long to draw all these structures. So this one has left. We now have a pause. This is this oxygen. Okay. And then we have This is what we would have. And now we have some base comes along. There's always bases that are shuttling. And in this case, it's the conjugate base of your acid. Your base will come along. Remove that hydrogen. Boom. And then we get to, now that I've drawn it specifically, OK, minus H plus. So whenever you see something protonated, when we talk about that proton leaving, there's always something that takes it off, okay? And it may be uh, a specific base that we added, or it may just be the conjugate base of whatever acid we've added. So one of the things you have to get used to in organic chemistry is realizing that whenever a proton, protons can jump around like crazy, and they jump around by having a base, grab them, and move them somewhere else. So that's why they can go all over the place on different molecules. Now we still have we have our base around, uh, and it may just be the conjugate base of the acid that we're using, but whenever we have an acid, the acid gives up its proton, we have a conjugate base. So this base now is going to remove another proton, it's going to remove this proton, removes that proton, the electrons that are in that carbon-hydrogen bond reorganize into that carbon oxygen to make this a double bond. And these electrons uh, typically uh, just leave. And they'll leave on there. And we get our oxidized compound. This hydrogen is that hydrogen right there. And we had a carbon-oxygen single bond. These electrons reorganized. We now have a carbon-oxygen double bond. OK, so, uh, oops. Yeah, no, that's fine. So we may want to put one more arrow there for bookkeeping purposes in terms of moving the electrons. 
So where are we? There's, there's our base, and the other thing we now have is this compound. Oops. Okay, look at our chromium. Our chromium has now been reduced. Okay, this is the oxidation step right here. Okay, it's a lot easier with uh, organic compounds. With inorganic compounds, you end up having a lot of atoms that you have to draw. So most of the time we don't go through all the mechanisms, but we do need to know what's going on. And be careful again with protons. Protons just jump around. So be aware that if you have a proton in this part of the molecule and you have another basic functionality on the mo molecule somewhere else, that proton can get over there through a series of acid-base reactions. Give up a proton and then deposit that proton elsewhere in the molecule. And that happens a lot for organic chemistry. A lot of times we have these protons jumping around on different parts of the molecule, typically to, to where we need them to be uh, to make the reactions go. So although that mechanism looks very complicated, uh, once you get a little more comfortable, uh, you'll see that it's not as complicated as it seems. Now, so Jones reagent is great. Uh, another reagent that we often use and the mechanism is more or less exactly the same is uh, potassium permanganate. One of the problems with this in terms of primary alcohol is notice that we have our aldehyde there and the aldehydes particularly under acidic or basic conditions can react with water and we're going to be talking about this reaction specifically a little bit later so I won't go into the mechanism but They form these things called aldehyde hydrates, okay? Notice this looks very much like a secondary alcohol. It has the OH group there, and then on that same carbon that the OH is bonded to, there's another hydrogen. So this is kind of like a secondary alcohol, and it can go through the same series of vents to end up giving us the carboxylic acid. In other words, we can't stop at the aldehyde here because there's water around. Okay, another reagent that we often use is uh, this is a secondary alcohol and another reagent we often use is potassium permanganate and we typically do this under basic conditions in water with heat, okay? One, you get used to seeing this. Quite often you will see uh, reactions written like this where we have a lot of the reagents on the top of the arrow and then solvent and conditions underneath. And these may be, in this case, the reagents and potentially catalyst or more reagent. This is potassium permanganate. That's the potassium permanganate. Typically we do it in potassium hydroxide solution uh, with some water and some heat and we will get our oxidized compound. In this case the manganese gets reduced. So one of the things you might want to do is take a look uh, at these things and figure out the oxidation state 
of the chromium or the manganese in these. I will tell you, if you Google mechanism for the permanganate oxidation, I what, uh, a lot of the first few pages that come up with Google and Google Images anyway are incorrect mechanisms. So that's one of the things that's a little bit dangerous about, and in fact, it's actually from, you might think it's fairly reputable, and I think it's just a mistake that someone made when they're making the notes. Uh, I think it's at Dartmouth where it ends up. The mechanism is just slightly wrong. Uh, so that's one of the dangers of Google. Even though I'm a big fan and big proponent of Google, uh, we have to be a little bit careful. So this is great if we want to oxidize uh, primary alcohols to acids and or secondary alcohols to ketones. It's not very good if what we want is an aldehyde. Okay, so if we want Okay, so if we want a primary alcohol, or if we want an aldehyde, we use a primary alcohol. But what else do we have to do? We have to make sure that we do this in the absence of what? Water. Right. Okay, so we can do this. One trick is to use something called pyridinium chlorochromate. The mechanism for this particular reaction is really exactly the same as it is with Jones reagent. We have uh, acid, a chromic acid. It actually turns out it'll end up being a chlorochromic acid. But we use this compound. Okay, this is pyridinium. This thing is pyridine. You will see this later in the course. Again, I promise. Pyridine turns out it's uh, a decent base. Okay, so you can react it with uh, chlorochromic acid and it easily gets protonated. And the other part of this is chromium. O3 Cl, yeah. Okay, so we have this salt. It turns out it's, it's, it's like an acid, but our proton has been removed. It's chlorochromic acid, reacts with pyridine. It just protonates it. It makes this thing. Uh, by the way, this is what our There's our chlorochromate, that's what it looks like. Okay, so now you can see that this thing can easily react with a nucleophile like a, second, a primary alcohol to form an ester. That's what happens. But this thing is soluble. in dichloromethane. Okay, dichloromethane is a nice solvent, has a very low boiling point, somewhere around 40, so you can easily remove it. Uh, it's a little bit polar, so it can dissolve some nice polar things, and we can dry it. That is, we can make it anhydrous so that there's no water around. Soluble in methylene chloride or dichloromethane, and we can dry. Okay, so this allows us then
This allows us to do reactions on aldehydes and stop them. I'm sorry, reactions on primary alcohols and stop them at the aldehyde. So what you will see is if we have some uh, aldehyde, we usually make our uh, pyridinium chlorochromate by adding CrO3 plus HCl plus pyridine and pyridine remembers this thing. And that gives us our PCC. And you'll often see it just called PCC. One of the things you'll have to get used to for organic chemistry is you see a lot of reactions. We use a lot of acronyms. And you'll have to just come to get to know these, these acronyms. Uh, if during an exam you see an acronym and you don't know it, feel free to ask and I'll probably tell you and I'll probably tell the whole class. Uh, once you get into uh, later organic chemistry courses, they stop telling you the acronyms because you become expected uh, to know them. So we can take a primary alcohol and we react it with PCC. Uh, in dichloromethane. So that's down so we have PCC in dichloromethane. We typically make our PCC by adding uh, pyridine and chromate, tri chromium trioxide uh, in solution and we bubble HCl gas through it and that makes our PCC. A uh, nice easy convenient way to make it and we get in this case an aldehyde and we can stop there, okay? Now, that's great. We now have a way of making uh, aldehydes. Uh, we can use the same compound to make ketones. Just an oxidizing agent. Why might we uh, not want to use any of these compounds? especially in this day and age. So uh, many years ago we wouldn't care. We'd make these compounds. In fact, many years ago they'd work in labs, they'd make stuff and then there's a lot of stuff left over. They'd go out and they'd throw it in the pond or in the river uh, or in a lake. We don't do that anymore uh, and we can't throw things down the sink. But chromium is nasty stuff, okay? You guys are too young to remember the movie Aaron Brockovich probably, but chromium-6 is very toxic and chromium itself uh, is not particularly good, so we try to avoid using it. There's another reagent, uh, another reagent we can make and use. And this one's a little different. This is called the Swern oxidation. Okay, and the Swern oxidation involves dimethyl sulfoxide. That's dimethyl sulfoxide. It turns out it's a nice solvent because it's fairly polar. And why is it polar? We can draw a resonance structure. That looks like this. That resonance structure actually contributes significantly to the structure of dimethyl sulfoxide. So it is a nice polar compound. It's kind of stinky. It's also interesting. Dimethyl sulfoxide, if you get some on your skin, you'll taste sulfur right away. It gets in your skin and absorbs, gets right into your bloodstream, and you'll taste sulfur. They used to use it, they thought it would be good for delivering medicines. They used to use it 
uh, for arthritis and stuff. Uh, it's actually not that toxic or anything. It's, it's, I wouldn't drink buckets of it, but it's not that bad. But it is irritating because when you work with it, quite often all of a sudden you, you taste sulfur. Uh, so pe people don't like to use it in the lab. The other thing we use is ox aloe. Ox aloe. I can't spell. Ox aloe chloride. This is an interesting compound. It's, it's quite reactive. Uh, this compound, if you throw it in water, it reacts right away. Uh, so it reacts with dimethyl sulfoxide. And we do these reactions at minus 60 degrees or thereabouts. Uh, and we typically, oh yeah, we also need a base. This is a very common base you'll see. So what we will see is we will see we have some primary alcohol. And we'll have an arrow. And we'll talk about DMSO. COCl2, COCl2. Notice COCl2, there's the COCl portion, two of them. That's oxalyl chloride. Uh, let's make our arrow longer. And we also use triethylamine uh, as our base. Uh, And it's kind of two steps. We do this in two steps. Uh, so the oxalochloride and the dimethyl sulfoxide is to make the compound that actually does the oxidation. Now your the notes uh, aren't that good because they have a bit of a mistake in there. These are typically done without a source of protons around, really. Uh, but we have dimethyl sulfoxide. Reacts with oxalochloride. And it gives us this compound. This is chlorodimethyl, this is the chlorodimethyl sulfonium and it's balanced with a chloride. What's the product of that? Oh, sorry. <laughs> what do you think it is? We have a primary alcohol and we're doing oxidation reactions. What's it going to be? An aldehyde, yeah. So it's an aldehyde. Sorry, thank you. Okay, so we just oxidize that carbon. That's the act of oxidizing reagent right there, this chlorodimethyl sulfonium cation. So what does it do? It reacts with an alcohol. Uh,
And I'm gonna put an alcohol here. How many people think they know what's happened? I, we know now that alcohols can act as nucleophiles. They're not particularly reactive nucleophiles. We can soup them up as nucleophiles by reacting them with very strong bases, removing the OH proton and making alkoxides, but we don't need to in this case. What do nucleophiles react with? You guys should know this. Electrophiles, electrophiles that's right, it's that simple. Nucleophiles react with electrophiles. We have a nucleophile. We have another compound there, it must be the electrophile. Where is the electrophilic center in this case? Where do you think it is? The sulfur has a positive charge on it, so that would be a good first guess, okay? So, we can simply push our arrows, and we end up getting this compound, our CH2 O H, I just formed a bond with the sulfur. Anything, uh, let's, let's keep track of everything. We formed a chloride. Am I done? My structure's okay now? Anything missing? Someone saying that oxygen has a charge, that's correct, right? The other thing you wanna remember uh, when you're doing all these things, if you keep track of everything, uh, your charges have to uh, add up, okay? So, in this case, uh, what else has a charge? Yeah. Okay, so that looks kind of odd, but quickly, you're just gonna lose that proton, right? So that's the other thing to remember. That looks a little odd, but that's quickly going to lose a proton. We now have and I'm writing this a little different and I'll tell you why in just a second. I'm just going to put minus H plus, okay? Uh, and our chloride we're going to forget about. We now have a nice, oops, there we go. There's our reactive species. We just lost this proton. That's what this minus H plus means over the arrow. Yes, a base took it off. Something came along and took it off. And we have base there because we have triethylamine. So we form this reactive looking species, and I've drawn it in kind of a funny way. Uh, now we, we can do this reaction and get to here, and now we do step two and we add the triethylamine. And I'm gonna add my triethylamine. I drew this a little funny. This one is an odd mechanism. We also have a proton here, and that mechanism we talked about typically, where we're gonna remove this proton, those electrons in that carbon-hydrogen bond would form the carbon-oxygen bond. In this particular case, it, it actually goes about in a bit of a funny way. As it turns out, these protons are quite acidic because they're next to that positively charged sulfur, okay? So they're very acidic and we can easily pull them off with a base such as triethylamine. And we end up getting, I'm gonna now do this. I really don't like teaching this in second year, but we've started doing this because it actually is a very common oxidizing reagent and it's easy to do these things in the lab, although I don't think we do it. But we have a negatively charged carbon. One of the things about negatively charged carbons, they're really good nucleophiles. What else would they be? When things are good nucleophiles, they are often good base. That's right. So it's just going to pull off this proton. We're going to end up getting that to go up there and we get this nice cyclic transition state, all our arrows getting pushed, and we get our 
C. There's the double bond we form. There's the H and we end up with our other product which is just dimethyl sulfide. We have reduced the sulfur. We've really just transferred the oxygen uh, that in a, in a way that was on dimethyl sulfoxide. Uh, we end up going from an oxidized form of sulfur to a reduced form of sulfur, okay? And this is our final product, this aldehyde. Uh, I would consider this to be one of the more difficult mechanisms you guys are going to come across, particularly just because of this step here. So if you happen, instead of having the base remove this proton, if you had the base remove this proton and move the electrons around, you end up with the same products and I would not really penalize you. There just happens to be a lot of evidence that shows that it goes through this type of mechanism. Okay, so that is the correct mechanism. If you did it the way we did all of the other ones, by having our base remove this and then just forming our oxygen double bond and spitting off dimethyl sulfide, uh, it's not a big deal, right? Okay, so I give the correct mechanism and that's confusing because this is an odd mechanism. And I'm not, during the course, during this course, I don't go out there trying to trick you guys. I will show you the exceptions and yes, some of the exceptions will appear on the midterms and the finals, but most things are not going to be exceptions, okay? So, there we've finished oxidations and I just want to quickly, uh, actually I, we don't have time, we only have two minutes. I want to tell you, the last two videos are posted on ACORN, uh, go ahead. One of the things you may want to do is make sure that you can go at, even though I'll sound like a chipmunk, but if you can go at 1.5 or 2 times speed, you can get through the videos a lot quicker. You may have to on YouTube uh, enable HTML5. So you just go to YouTube slash HTML5 to make sure that your browser has everything that allows you to speed things up, okay? So the videos will be posted uh, as we uh, are able to. Next class we're going to be talking about organometallic compounds. And then we should finish chapter 12.